Welcome to our very first conversation circle. Um, this is our first foray into the professional development program as it's been uh, approved by the Executive Management Committee and we're excited. Uh, today's session will be short and sharp. We've got uh, our speakers speaking for 10 minutes on their area of expertise. Uh, we haven't allowed any time for questions because we're hoping that uh, connections and conversations and communications will happen after this session and we want to keep everyone on time so that we're maximising the time that we have um, you guys as an audience and also for our presenters as well. Uh, the format that we've got today has been devised following the support of the uh, EMCR uh, day that was held uh, the day before the May conference and um, there was some really positive uh, um, feedback from those sessions. Um, also, uh, we kept hearing over and over during our consultation period that people were wanting to know what other labs and programs and projects were doing and, uh, and we're hoping that this kind of uh, information sharing session will work well um, to put to, you know, engender engage cross-centre communication. Uh, the other aim for today's session is to include and make accessible information across the centre. Uh, we're hoping to include uh, presenters from all nodes and to have all of our sessions available for people, um, you know, at all of the nodes as well. We have ANU and CSIRO nodes represented today and, uh, and we were hoping to have um, the other nodes uh, included in, in, uh, in, in the presentations as well. And we actually had um, Andres Potgita uh, lined up to speak today but the timing wasn't quite right and, um, and we were hearing that some sections weren't quite ready to present either but in future we're hoping to incorporate and include everyone in these kind of sessions. Uh, the webinar session that we're doing today is something that we're hoping to uh, use routinely throughout the professional development program and from our uh, first information sharing session on mentoring, we did have a couple of technical issues occur during that session, mainly with the audio, but we've sourced the problem and we're hoping that, um, and we're hoping that they will be um, ironed out in this session. And just as I looked over, I read that Hannah couldn't hear us, but now she's saying never mind. So hopefully <laughs> Hannah's got her audio sorted and uh, Adele's saying that she can hear through her. So hopefully that's going to be okay. But I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. So if you do have any issues, please do type a few things in um, because obviously the people who have their uh, mics muted, we're not going to be able to hear you. And also when we're presenting, it can be hard to hear anyway. So if you don't already have your um, mic muted, if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great, um, just to reduce the shuffling and those sorts of things. But I think that we're just about ready to go. Our first presenter today is uh, Rob Sherwood, and uh, he's going to be presenting on uh, Rubisco. So Rob, would you like to come and uh, join me here? hear a little bit of background noise. If you wouldn't mind just checking your system and making sure that your microphones are muted, that would be great. <laughs> All right, I think we might have it sorted. Okay, Rob? Oh, great. It all says much better. Yes, lovely. Okay. Well, thank you for join, joining this webinar this afternoon. And today, in my 10 minutes, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how we measure the Rubisco specificity for CO2. But I just want to begin first about uh, a bit of the background biochemistry of Rubisco and to sort of aim towards why we want to um, measure Rubisco specificity and compare it amongst uh, plant and other sort of organisms. 
So Rubisco is a bifunctional ca uh, cap catalyst. It confuses its substrate CO2 of oxygen. So when it fixes CO2, it, it's through the productive cycle of the photosynthetic carbon reduction cycle to produce triosphosphates that are the building blocks for carbohydrates. Unfortunately, that it, it mistakes CO2 for oxygen and lead, leading to photorespiration, which, uh, which is energetically wasteful for the plant. And so basically, risk of specificity looks at the reactions between carboxylation and oxygenation. So this is just to highlight the complexity of Rubisco catalysis. And really the first committed step in this series of five pasture reactions is the fixation of either CO2 or oxygen uh, to the indiol that's shown um, in the first part of the scheme. But you don't need to remember this scheme, it's just to show you the, the complexity. So really the important catalytic parameters that we focus on um, are listed in this slide. And basically the first one is the carboxylation turnover speed for CO2 fixation, and we refer that to as K-cat. We have the Rubisco catalytic turnover speed for oxygenation, and we refer that to as K-cat for, for oxygen. And then we also have um, the affinities for CO2 and oxygen. And then the bottom one is the one that we're focusing in on today is the specificity um, for CO2 as opposed to O2. So let's move into a bit more of a, a definition of Rubisco specificity and why we're sort of interested in measuring this parameter. So basically Rubisco specificity is, is uh, for a specificity for CO2 as opposed to oxygen and really it's the ratio uh, between the specificity for carbon dioxide and the specificity for oxygen. And so the formula is given below and so really uh, Rubisco specificity impacts uh, photosynthesis if we look at this uh, to assimilation uh, curve that's modelled here. So Rubisco specificity impacts the AUBP regeneration lim limited rate. So in theory, a higher Rubisco specificity should enable us to increase that AUBP regenerated rate. It also, uh, it's also impacts uh, at very low CO2s where we get to the um, CO2 compensation point in the absence of mitochondrial respiration. And at this point, um, um, uh, it, it, it affects in the gamma star value. So this slide here is just showing you that there is substantial diversity of Rubisco specificity am amongst higher plants. And this is looking at C3 plants and different biochemical subtypes of C4 grasses, as well as intermediates. And if we plot it versus its catalytic speed, we see that there is substantial variability and that we also see this uh, a minimal trade-off between the catalytic speed and the specificity. And what that means, the more specific you are for CO2, you seem to uh, be a decrease in the catalytic speed. And this is mainly for Form 1 marine rubiscos. We can also measure specificity across different temperatures, and this is just showing you some data that we have collected uh, for C4 grasses, where we've measured specificity at six different temperatures, and this enables us to get the temperature dependency for each of these enzymes, and, and it varies quite substantially, which is why we're interested in, in re measuring Rubisco specificity. So let's get into the assay. So some preliminary considerations for the assay is the purification of Rubisco. So it's important to be aware of actually how much Rubisco you have in your leaves. And so this determines how much leaf material that you actually need to uh, purify Rubisco at a, at a substantial concentration. It also, uh, also depends on um, your understanding or, or how many secondary metabolites that impede Rubisco solubility after extraction. And this is particularly important when we get into uh, uh, species such as eucalyptus trees where there's high phenolic compounds that actually precipitate Rubisco out of your solution. And we're now developing ways to remedy this. And so, so once we've sorted out this part of the extraction, we then we have two chromatography steps. The first one is just to um, ba basically an ion exchange prep where we uh, loot Rubisco off in a steep salt gradient using a Biorad macro high Q column. And what this does, it removes any sort of nasty compounds that may block the chromatography in the second step. And so the second step is to use size, size exclusion. So Rubisco is a large molecule in, in, in higher plants. It's about 550 kilodaltons, and a SuperDEX um, 200 separates this really nicely from other plant proteins. 
this is ab an absolute requirement for Risco specificity measurements because uh, this removes other enzymes that interfere with the reactions of the specificity reaction. So the apparatus that we have in the Whitney lab is the uh, Warburg apparatus, which was made back in 1975, so well before I was born. And then we have a set of Wostoff pumps on the right, which are set to deliver a 500 ppm CO2 in a carrier gas oxygen. And these are just showing the, the uh, stands that we have for our assay vials. So this Warburg apparatus, we, we can set the temperature of the water bath with great accuracy, and then it oscillates our assay vials around so we can actually get adequate gas mixing. So the assay components, we need purified Rubisco enzyme, we need a proper buffer as stated there, and it's always important to note the pH of 8.3, just because this impacts the solubility of the CO2 within solution. Carbonic anhydrase is super crucial because it uh, enables the e equilibrium of CO2 between the, the air phase and the gas phase, the air phase and the liquid phase to happen quite quickly and to be maintained. And then we need the labelled ABP. So this is just a lot of detail here in this slide about assay conditions. So it's important to equilibrate the Rubisco in the supplied gas mix. And usually this is 0.05% CO2 and 0.95% oxygen. And so we, we usually do this oscillating for one hour to make sure the actual solution is equilibrated in these gases that has the Rubisco. Then we start the reaction with added triated ABP. Then after uh, 30 minutes, we add alkaline phosphatase. And this is crucial to remove uh, the phosphates off the products. And so um, then we do another chromatography step that removes any unreacted ribulose. And ribulose is a problem because it actually chromographically separates at the same stage as glycerate. So it's important to remove ribulose from the reaction. And then the final step is to apply it to a chromatography column using HPLC. Um, it's labelled here the, a, the Aminex HPX um, column. And the alluent is, is written there. And this column is at 65 degrees C. So how do we determine the specificity using this reaction? Well, from the HPLC trace shown in the top right corner, we see that we get radioactive peats shown there in glycerate and glycolate. And by looking at the amount of counts in these peaks, we form the ratio between them, which is noted in the formula as R. And then you times this by the molar fraction of the oxygen and CO2 that you've given into the system. And that gives you your relative specificity number. So a typical timeline for this assay. So purification of Rubisco um, takes about 40 minutes uh, per enzyme, um, depending on how easy it is to, to grind up your, your plant material. The second chromatography step takes about 45 minutes on the Superdex to purify it. And the, really the total assay time for six Rubiscos is two and a half hours. Uh, and the final chromatography of the reaction products of the glycerate and glycolate is 30 minutes per rep. And I usually do about three reps for each Rubisco. So if you wish to find out any more detail about our method, don't he hesitate to email me and also refer you to this paper back in 94 by Heather Kane, which has the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the synthesis of the AEBP and more about the chromatographic methods that we use. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rob, for taking us through uh, some more information about Rubisco. Uh, next in the lineup, we have Florence Danilla. Uh, she's going to be speaking about uh, fluorescence microscopy. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about a part of my work, which is the plasmodesmata quantification. So plasmodesmata quantification is basically a combination of two uh, methodologies. So I use both uh, fluorescence microscopy, which is partly the 3D confocal imaging, and um, in tandem with FEM. So since I have only 10 minutes to discuss 
uh, a, a method. So I chose the uh, leaf tissue clearing for 3D confocal imaging to discuss today. And in this title page, you can see a video of a uh, reconstructed 3D image that I can um, generate from um, a leaf, uh, a cleared leaf tissue hybridized with a particular antibody. So before I start, I'll um, talk about my project. So my project is on plasmodesmata, or PD. So they are nanostructures um, that are responsible for um, providing both cytoplasmic and endoplasmic continuum, um, essentially for transport of metabolites. And um, this is very interesting for us. So I'm, I'm working with um, Susanna von Kammer as a PhD student. And um, working with Susanna, we need to um, work on photosynthesis, and uh, we found that Plasmodesmata in one of the previous literature was correlated, was possibly correlated with uh, photosynthetic efficiency. And so we wanted to look at the difference between um, photo, two photosynthetic uh, systems, um, which are specifically the C3 and C4 plants. So for the leaf tissue clearing, so for the step one, so leaf tissue clearing, I did or based the leaf tissue clearing on the clarity protocol. So Clarity is first um, established using um, mouse brain, so animal cell. And what they did is to first fix the tissue in a hydrogel monomer um, infusion. Uh, this will allow the fixation of the protein of interest as well as the structure. And then the second would be the hybridization where you then um, embed the whole cell in the in the, hydrogel t in the hydrogel mixture, and so it will preserve all the structures as well as the protein. And then the, ne the next step would be to clarify it. So by clarifying it, this will, this will um, allow the removal of the pigments as well as the lipids that can impede the penetration of light during imaging. And so I did this. I did a similar thing with um, plant tissue. So in the what's this, right panel, uh, you can see uh, the leaf untreated, which appear um, green. And then after um, clearing it, so fixing it and then clearing it, you can see that they become translucent. And it depends on your tissue. So in this case, you can see that rice or rice sativa is tough, is tough. And so it's not really completely clear. But then corn and wheat, they're a bit softer. And so you can see that um, they are more um, transparent or translucent. And then um, the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell is the presence of an additional um, membrane, which is the cell wall. And so in addition, or as a modification, to the um, original clarity protocol, we then um, added this enzyme digestion step, which will then um, make that cell wall impermeable to the antibody or stain that we will be using for the next step. And details for this um, uh, modification method can be found in this um, P-clarity um, paper that were that was published early this year. And so for the next step would be the um, hybridization and staining. So um, in my case, I use a Kalos antibody. So Kalos is an associated protein with plasma desmata. And so in your right panel, you can see a figure of the structure of the, of the plasma desmata and where Kalos is localized. And so after using a Kalos antibody, this will then this area will then be stained as um, green or the green fluorescence in the left panel picture. And so you can see that, um, let me see. Um, you can see that the signal on your right panel have a bit of a two, two line, two line signal, which corresponds to the presence of callus at both ends of the plasma desmata. And I also, uh, in addition to the antibody, I also used um, uh, post, uh, stain, which is the calcofluor white, and calcofluor white will basically stain the cell wall. And so that will be your magenta fluorescence. So after doing this, um, we now talk about mounting and refractive index. So I'm talking about refractive index because this is a very important concept in terms of um, 3D imaging. So on, so refractive index is the measure of the bending of a ray of light as it passes from one medium to another. So in A, you can see when a uh, leaf material is um, not cleared, so it's, it contains a lot of pigment, and so the light can, can penetrate and be absorbed, and then no light can bend and cannot see anything uh, apart from the surface. 
and then B is when you have the tissue clarified, but then you mount it on a solution that is not um, that is not compatible with its refractive index, and so you can see that the bending of light is all throughout, and the result will be a blurry image. But then on C, you have mounted your clarified tissue in a uh, in a solution that um, is compatible with its refractive index, and so it, the light can be absorbed and only bend. Uh, in a certain direction, and you will see a very um, resolved and very sharp image. And so mounting solution options can either be uh, a ready-made or commercially available, but focus uh, with a refractive index equivalent to 1.45, which is also the same as the hydrogel, but focus glare is very expensive. And so if you don't have uh, much budget, you can have an alternative mounting solution, which is 80% glycerol. But uh, the limitation for the 80% glycerol is it is not um, uh, applicable for thicker sample. And since I'm working with leaf, so it's relatively thin, so that's fine. And so after all of this, so you image it. And then so for the imaging, since it's perfectly clear, you can set, uh, you can do a Z stack. And so you can set the, the image from the top to the bottom of the leaf and then um, image through it. Um, you, depending on what microscope you're using, you can use uh, two channels or multiple channels at the, simultaneously. And so after imaging, you reconstruct, you have this 3D reconstructed image. So in this case, I use core. And then the, depending on the software, you can actually cut it differently. So on the right corner, topmost, um, that will be the transfer section. And then directly below it would be the paradermal section, and then across it on the left, um, right-hand corner would be, um, lower left would be the, uh, lower right would be the um, longitudinal section. And so for the logistics, so in terms of cost, so for the cost, uh, you need to buy all the hydrogel reagents. All the components will be found in, the, in that nature paper that I um, mentioned earlier. And then you also need your enzymes to digest your tissue. And then depending on your protein of interest, you need to buy all the antibodies and stains. And then if you have your own microscope, then you don't need to pay for it. But if you're using others, then they might have a fee. And then for your time, it's a bit long. So at least three months if you're very lucky. So if you have corn or wheat, which is really easy to clarify. But if you have rice, then maybe longer, maybe up to six months. But in terms of fixation, it's just two days. Um, clearing at least four to six weeks. So actually it's clearing that will be um, varied. So depending on your on the um, rigidity of your um, clarification. So if your tissue is very difficult to clarify, then it will take you some more time. But And then digestion as well. So usually it took me two weeks. Then hybridization and staining to another two weeks. And for imaging, two to three hours because, yeah, it, it depends on the step and the resolution that you want. But in my case, since I'm working with a nanostructure, so I want it to be really well resolved. So, so that's it. And these are the people I want to thank. So the Von Camera Lab and um, my supervisory panel, guys from Newcastle who actually published the paper, um, the Advanced Microscopy Center in both ANU and CSRO and um, Meet Me Lab for continuous you saw the action. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Florence, for sharing your um, talk and your beautiful images with us. Uh, next in the lineup, we have Dimitri Tolida and Vincent Chaussois uh, talking about the mass spectrometer and its use in the price lab. So hi guys. Um, so I'm Vincent, I'm Dimitri. and uh, when we were asked to present the mass spectrometers, we thought uh, maybe we can bring the mass spectrometers to the room. <laughs> and then we had another idea. We made a video, so we thought we hope it would be more didactic. Uh, but yeah, it turns out I think the the, vid the video was a terrible idea. I think if we had to do it again. Me. We we'll bring the mass back here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how to start it. Okay, I'm going to start it down. Yeah. 
right. Badger and in prices groups. So today we make this video for the showcase in photosynthesis to present you the techniques about the mass spec. We have several mass spectrometers in our lab, which have different specifications, but the principle is always the same. These mass spectrometers are slightly different to the ones that are used for proteomics or metabolomics, both in their design and their uses. They are especially designed to discriminate different isotopes of gases. As for us, we use them mostly for CO2 and oxygen isotope ratios. Those gases are directly coming to the mass spectrometer through a semi parallel membrane, thus allowing real-time monitoring of the gases dissolved in your sample. So this is what it looks like when it's assembled and ready for experiments. So when I breathe on it, the CO2 from my breath is going to go through the membrane, to the line, and to the mass spec. It's going to be detected by the detectors in the mass spec and appear as a nice peak on the graph here. That is the CO2 that I just breathed onto the membrane directly. So this is what a cuvette looks like. It's composed of a plug with a hole in the middle to inject stuff into your sample, a water jacket to keep your sample at the right temperature, and the cuvette itself. Inside the cuvette, there's a magnetic bar to stir your sample and keep it homogenized, and the membrane, the semi-permeable membrane, which is pretty thin. And finally, the gases that go through the membrane go into this little hole to the line and eventually to the mass spec. So what can we do with our mass spec? First of all, we can use it for oxygen production or consumption. So basically, it's for the photosynthesis and respiration. And we can use for chloro respiration if you use some isotopes. We can use for the CO2 production and consumption. And we can couple the mass spec with the chlorophyll fluorescent with the palm. And like this, cross the information about photosynthesis. We can also use the mass spec for the composition points or the permeability for CO2 and um, bicarbonate across membranes like for cells, chloroplasts, or thylakoids. Another use of the mass spec is uh, for endymology, so basically to get the Rubisco parameters or the carbonic anhydrase activity. And we can probably do more. So what's going to happen in the cubit? In order to explain, we are going to use these black balls for carbon, red for unlabeled O16, and blue for labeled O18. First, we'll add some O18 labeled bicarbonate. This bicarbonate dissociates in water to form labeled CO2, which has a mass of 49. Since the buffer is not labeled with O18, the molecules of water are composed of O16 atoms. These unlabeled molecules of water can react with the labeled CO2 to form bicarbonate. A dynamic equilibrium is formed between CO2 and bicarbonate that is pH and temperature dependent. The exchange between CO2 and bicarbonate occurs non catalytically in the buffer, but carbonic anhydrase can catalyze it. Here, we lost one labeled oxygen and CO2 form as a mass of 47. One more time, bicarbonate is formed, and we lose the last labeled oxygen that produces mass 45 CO2. And then we have unlabeled bicarbonate. Therefore, we lose labeling over time, and the speed at which we lose it gives a measure of CA activity. On these graphs, the purple line is 49, the blue line is 47, and the light blue line is 45. 
as we have seen before, 49 is converted to 47 and 45 in a pH and temperature dependent reaction without the help of any enzyme. However, if you add carbonic anhydride to the sample, you see that the speed of conversion of 49 to 47 and eventually to 45 is greatly increased. Precisely measuring the extent to which it is increased gives us an estimate of how much CA activity was injected in the sample. The sample in the cuvette can be anything from a leaf disc, a suspension of living cells such as Chlamydomonas or cyanobacteria, a preparation of chloroplasts, thylakoids, or even protein extracts. Here is the very simple example showing oxygen production and consumption by living Chlamydomonas cells. As you can see, when we add the cells to the cuvette, and keep the cuvette in the dark, the cells start consuming the oxygen present. When we turn the light on, they start doing photosynthesis and producing oxygen. And when we turn the light back off, they go back to consuming the oxygen. This is a very simple trace showing only one gas, oxygen, but you can actually recall much more data at the same time, as you can see here. You can even couple this data with um, PAM data that you have acquired from the same sample at the same time, as we have explained before. By now, you know almost everything about on the mass uh, We can give you some few information um, about the cost. It's a very expensive uh, equipment, around 300, 400, thousand dollars. They have no specific running cost except for isotopes. Um, difficulty is um, it's an instrument quite sensitive uh, and expensive, so it needs training and supervision um, by advanced users to be able to use it. And one second opinion tension can take up to a week to fix. For the timeline, uh, sample preparation is very variable, uh, coming from two minutes for an algal culture to four hours to prepare uh, thylakoids. The data acquisition is about 15, 30 minutes per run. So we can make 10 to 20 samples per day. The data processing is a little bit less than one hour. And for the data interpretation, can be from 10 minutes to 10 years. So very long time. And to finish, take home message is you can use our mass spec in order to measure photosynthesis, respiration, composition points, CO2 bicarbonate permeability, Rubis coactivity, C activity, and don't hesitate to, to contact us for more information and to plan your next experiments with us. to Vincent and uh, Dimitri for that excellent video, even though it might have taken a bit of time, it was, the, um, the end product was wonderful and I'm, I may try and work that into an education campaign somewhere along the way. <laughs> uh, next, uh, we have El Elena Martin Avila talking about uh, plastid genome transformation. Fantastic. 
Hello everyone. So today I'm going to be talking to you about what we do best in the Whitney lab after risk of catalysis assays, and it's um, chloroplast transformation. So what's a plastic genome transformation and what we use it? It's a method to modify chloroplast gene. We can modify the sequence. We can also modify, uh, alter the um, arrangement. Uh, we can even transfer new genes into chloroplast. And we are really interested in the center in this technique because the plastum or chloroplast genome encodes for proteins involved in photosynthesis, such as components of the photosystems 1 and 2 of the cytochrome BF complex, ATP sign phase, and of course, of the Um subunit. Some of the advantages of chloroplast trans transformation versus uh, nuclear transformation, for example, are the high levels of transient expression. As you can see in that photograph, there can be uh, many chloroplasts per cell and many plastom or chloroplast genomes per chloroplast, so you can have 10,000 copies per cell. You are allowed to have multi-gene expression due to the chloroplast prokaryotic life system, so you can introduce block of genes under a common promoter or an operand in one single transformation step, which is really helpful when you are looking at engineering a whole pathway. Also, uh, there is a lack of epigenetic effects in chloroplast um, biotechnology, also gene, silence, gene silencing and position effects. And this is as a result partially of the precise integration that I'll be talking about a bit later. So biolistics is the most widespread and effective, um, efficient technology to develop, um, develop to, start, to stably transform plastids in different plant species. There are other techniques, and this is just part of the process. So the process is pretty much divided in two steps. And this part I'm going to be talking about is the first step, or the physical part, in which we actually deliver the DNA into the organelles. Um, we use helium pressure to accelerate tungsten and gold particles that are coated with DNA, and they penetrate in the cell wall and the membranes, and the recombinant DNA that's, again, that's delivered into the plastic. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the device we use. It's a biolistic PDS-1000 helium instrument. We also call it a gene gun. And it's a chamber that is connected to a pump that creates a vacuum and connected to a helium line that produces the helium pressure. It hasn't been changed a lot since the early 90s when it was developed. And now it's a thing by Rad, the company that um, sources it. So a lot of the pictures I'll be showing are coming from the Biorad website or the um, manual. So there are different parameters that we can change that affect the transformation efficiency. So I'm showing you a table there to show you biological, bio, diff, sorry, different biological systems, such as bacteria, yeast, and plants. And plants are the ones that we are obviously mostly interested. So we can change, for example, the microcarrier, which is those uh, tungsten or gold particles. We can change the tungsten or gold, or we can also use different uh, diameters in microns, as you can see there. We can also change the vacuum. It's not indicated there, but it's in inches of mercury. And uh, we can also change, that. I can show you here in the picture that I just put up, uh, the chamber. And you can see there's different distances, marks than A, B, and C, that by changing those, we can also alter the efficiency. So for what we do, as you can see, uh, the target distance, which is a distance between the open screen and the cell, is 9 centimeters. And the helium uh, pressure that we use in PSI is 1,100, which can be altered by changing the rupture disk, as you can see in the before and after picture on the bottom. Um, so by changing different um, uh, rupture disks, we can put a higher pressure and lower pressure. So for the machine we're using, we're using those settings for plants, and we're asking everyone that uses the machine not to change them because they're pretty optimized for what we do in tobacco. Um, so when we have the DNA delivered inside the cell, uh, how does it get integrated? Because we're talking about a stable transformation. So the integration of the DNA, independently of the method you use, is also a, it's always through homologous recombination. So I can show you here a representation not to scale of the native plastum or the chloroplastium. And when we deliver the targeting vector um, in here through biolistic, we see it contains some left and right flanking sequences which are represented in green. Uh, and they are homologous to the native plastome sequences, also in green. And we have the target genes that I've represented in yellow. So once we integrate it or we deliver into the chloroplast, homologous recombination happens and we trick the plant into thinking it wants to get that 
transient in and we set it in. Um, within the chloroplast, you have to think of this a highly oxidative environment. We have uh, photosynthesis going on, UV light, there's a lot of damage into the DNA. So homologous recombination is a repair mechanism pathway that is highly boosted. So that's why we can use it or utilize this natural pathway to integrate our DNA in a stable manner. Uh, on the right hand side, I'll show you a representation of the chloroplast genome which I took from the Yukawa paper in 2005. This is a nicotine and tobacco. And I highlighted in red the PLF transformation vector we use in the, in the Whitney lab and in blue the PRB vectors. So, what I want to show you there is you can actually customize those flanking, sorry, flanking sequences and target any part of the chloroplast that you would like. So, if you're interested in targeting a gene or a specific part, you can do it by just adjusting or modifying your targeting vector. So, uh, about the process time frame, um, you need to do the entire process in vitro. You need to accept the techniques. So, first thing, you need to sterilize some seeds and grow them. And once they are for around two weeks, you can transfer them to a bigger pot, but they have to stay three to four weeks, depending on the gene, the gene line that you're using, the, the plant line that you're using for bombardment. Then you cut the leaves and you bombard them. And that process takes less than a day. So you can prepare your tungsten particles, coat them with the DNA, and cut and shoot within the day. And then you have to cut those uh, that leaf in a small um, little pieces and transfer them to new plates under selection and you have to do it you have to wait two days in the middle and then you transfer it to selection and after three to four weeks usually picks after five weeks you start seeing those putative transformants it's essential as i mentioned there to select an appropriate marker for isolating a stable plasmid transformants uh, and i'll be talking about it in a minute uh, then you transfer them to fresh media and it's really important that you keep that selection pressure going. And that's a process you will have to do a number of times. As I mentioned, you have many copies of the chloroplast genome, so you might have to do it a number of times until everything that is in the cell is actually being transformed. Uh, and after a few weeks, you can transfer to routine media and get your plants that you will eventually put in soil and start analyzing. So the entire process could take up to two, three, four, five months, depending on what you're transforming. Um, is the most efficient uh, marker that we have at the moment for the chloroplast transformation is AADA, which uh, encodes for aminoglycoside 3 adenyl transferase, and it confers resistance by inactivating spectinomycin and streptinomycin, and it's a non-lethal marker, which I believe is very important for the selection process. Um, it's also a non-autonomous market, and I like to highlight that because a lot of people are having troubles in when they come to this technique. Uh, this means that confers the phenotype, or in this case the resistance it confers, it, that it confers it not only to the organelle in which that uh, is transformed, but it also protects neighboring plastics by locally decreasing the effective concentration of the drug. And that means if you're not very, very thorough in keeping that selection pressure and transferring to fresh media every so often, your tissue around could be still heteroplasmic. And this is what I mean when I show you the picture. There is a, a little drawing of a, a plastic, um, uh, sorry, a plant cell and then a spaghetti-like nucleus. And then we have different chloroplasts. And you see one of them has a dark dot is being transformed. But there's many plastons within each chloroplast, so you have to keep the selection and you have that chimeric stage in which you have cells transform and untransform. And you really need to go all the way through until you have a homoplasmic cell in which everything is being transformed. If you don't do that, you end up in soil with plants that might look like this. You might actually not say, depending on the phenotype you get in with your transformation, but if you get plants that look like this, if you mess up with some of the genes, the photosynthetic pathway, uh, that means your plant might not be homoplasmic and your um, your seeds won't be homoplasmic so you, you need to go back to your tissue culture and make sure you get the plant to the homoplasmic level. So then you need screening uh, to check if your plants are actually homoplasmic and also if they are real and the reason is because spontaneous mutations to spectinomycin resistance are very common. You can get mutation in plastic genes encoding for example for the 16S and, um, uh, ribosomal RNA and that release the sensitivity of the individual ribosomes. So you need to make sure you actually have real transformants and you need to make sure the transformants are homoplasmic. So one of the things you can do if you're using one of the lines that we've developed in the Whitney lab, like such as the CMTRL or the RNAi CMTRL, uh, is use a native page screen, which is pretty much a protein gel at denaturing, non denaturing, sorry. So you can see that Rubisco in that line runs uh, a high molecular weight of 2,500 and 
20. I think it might be a bit higher according to Rob. I think it's 540. Um, and the alliance that we have developed has a, have a, a Rubisco which runs much lower. It's an L2 Rubisco, much more small. So you can see which ones are transformed by comparing the molecular weight. So you can see those ones are transformed, but you can see they're not homoplasmic. They still contain some of the genome and some transformed. So this is a very quick method, but if you're working with wild type and other lines, this might not be the method you can use. So then in that case, you can use, for example, a PCR screen. Uh, and this is a very simple method where I would emphasize here. On the top, I have um, the site for recombination gene insertion. So the, the top green figure is the wild type. And the bottom one is the transforming, which you can see the green corresponds to the target in arms. The, the purple bits is the, the rest of the uh, chloroplast and what's been inter integrated, the chloroplast genome. And the rest color bits are the genes we've introduced. So you want to uh, make sure that when you uh, create creating your primers, you do it outside the flanking region. So you're actually amplifying your uh, real integrated plasmids, not wherever you are already shot and your you know targeted plasmid that you shot. So this is very, very important. Um, uh, then you run a DNA gel. In this case I'm showing something that shows no band if if you have um, not transformant or a band if, if you have a positive transformant. But you can actually create different plasmids, uh, different primers, so you can see different size bands if that's what you prefer. Because in this case, you won't be able to see if it's homoplasmic genesis transform. What I always recommend, and I always do, is the sudden blood, which is a DNA analysis, so you get your plant, and then you need a bit more tissue for that, so you might want to do a previous step first to check, and then maybe get that. You don't need an awful lot, especially in plastoms. When we're working with the chloroplast, you have a high copy number, but you need to extract the DNA, and you need to cut it with an enzyme, and then you run it on a gel, the fragments, and, and then you create a probe. So on the bottom, you can see, do you select your digestion enzymes? That are gonna give you a differential pattern between the transform and the untransformed lines. So in this case, it's untransformed, and the top in green gives you a 7.7 uh, .7 kV, you can see on the bottom gel on the right, while the transform lines show you a 3.8 kV. And again, it's really important that the digestion enzyme that you choose, it's outside the flanking region, so it'll show you that it's integrated within the plastum and you're not picking up just your plasmid that you just shot. So that way you can not only tell if it's homoplasmic, as you can see on my lines that are checked in there, this is for the PRD vectors are homoplasmic, but you can also check if you have any alternative recombination events that might be unwanted. So it's a bit more informative, though it takes a bit more time. Doing a PCR, we all know it takes maybe one day, and doing the sudden blood is a process in which you, you need to create your probe, you need to put P32, so it involves radioactivity and screening, so it might take two to three days to actually complete the process. And I don't have much time to talk too much more, so I want to say thank you to everyone in the Whitney Lab, and don't hesitate to contact us if you have any problems or any doubts, or you want to organize some crop of transformation. Uh, thank you to Elena for taking us uh, uh, through uh, the uh, transformation process. Uh, last on the lineup, we have uh, Gonzalo Estrevilla and Jose Jimenez Bernie. They're going to be talking about phenomics. And uh, welcome, guys. Thank you. Hello, this is going to be a team talk presentation with, between me and Bernie. And um, I will first start uh, bringing to your attention some other technologies that uh, are useful in some circumstances that we use regularly uh, up, uh, up the hill CSRO for different type of works. Um, I decided uh, not to talk about um, gas exchange, particularly uh, portable system, because most people in the center are familiar with. Um, I hope that was a right assumption. Instead, I want to bring to your attention a couple of uh, other systems that we use for high throughput screen of, for example, transpiration. So let's start um, with this um, clip. Uh, it's called uh, viscous flow pyrometer or VFP, or very fast pyrometer, because it's a very fast way to assess the porosity of a, uh, of a, um, uh, a sheet, a blade. Uh, and it works by basically very, very simple, simple, very simple principle. Um, there's, a, there's a amount of um, air in that um, 
body of the instrument that is displaced and this instrument measures how much time it takes for the air to go through a leak. So this type of um, mass flow um, system is uh, it measures double resistance so it gives you a, in this display will show you uh, a time and in milliseconds so that you can convert that into conductance as inverse of the resistance. Uh, let me tell you that this, uh, with this system, we, we managed to measure 100 flag leaves in 10 minutes, the three of us, so it was pretty fast, so it worked really well. And it's been published already that you can find new variability for things like tomato conductance using this type of uh, uh, method. The other uh, parameter that we use, uh, which works on a different principle, it is the uh, steady state parameter, which is um, a very uh, fancy design. It has not changed in the last 40 years, but it's pretty, uh, works pretty well. So the parameter has got a display, um, a very fancy keyboard there at the bottom. But more importantly, um, it's got a chamber where you clip uh, your leaf. And inside of the chamber, there is a thermal couple. And knowing the relative humidity, the ambient humidity, uh, you can calculate the gradient. Now, the, this system will not work without a calibration plate. And what it is, it's just a plastic perforated plate as that has orifices of different dimensions. And um, you can um, calibrate the instrument so the, so the instrument will give you an amount of flux of water vapor through a pores. Now, this is uh, good for leaves that um, have stomata on both sides. Well, this one, um, you have to be careful because um, somatic conductance differs between a baxial and a baxial, bottom and top side of the leaf. So depends how you put it, you get different values. So that's as much as the barometer go. This barometer takes uh, twice as much as this one if the plants are well watered, but it can give you a good estimation of conductance for the baxial and the adaxial leaf, uh, side of the leaf, and you actually get a number in millimoles of water. And the last uh, little instrument I want to show you, which I find it very useful, and it's also not new, but um, I think it's very good for field setting as well as for uh, glasshouse setting, is the SPAD, which is um, a little leaf clip where you put your leaf, just sorry, I should have a leaf, uh, like so, there, and you press, and you will get a reading, and the reading will be hopefully between 30 and 40, which is for a normal leaf and that will give you an estimation of the chlorophyll and the nitrogen. Um, this works by uh, measuring the amount of light that is transmitted through the leaf. So this uh, head here has got an LED that um, produces light in the red and infrared, about 350 and 940 nanometers. Um, the receiving head at the bottom there uh, measures the amount of transmitted light. So this is a very good way to non-invasively assess uh, chlorophyll status, uh, to assess the amount of nitrogen, and also uh, a measure of senescence as well. So with that, I'll pass it on to Bernie. Good. Thanks, Gonzalo. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the other technologies that we have at the Phenomic Center and also um, tell you a little bit more about how is the process of uh, running some of the projects and if you're interested about using some of the equipment at the HAPPC, how you need to do that. So pretty much um, uh, the idea uh, uh, on the type of work that we do uh, and in my case, it's really focused around the field phenotyping. Um, pretty much what we try to do is uh, go from a very tedious, time-consuming, and sometimes expensive tasks like uh, doing biomass cuts or even measuring light interception. You no normally don't find people as happy as this one in the picture because uh, here, especially in Australia, everything is full of flies. and It's very hot and warm, and you want to do that as quick as possible. And the other one is also how to replace things that we normally do in the lab or even gas exchange with non-destructive high-throughput measurements. Pretty much the way we try to do this is uh, using some of the equipment like the phenomobile light, I'll talk in a minute, hyperspectra and other things, put that through different machine learning, computer vision and fancy algorithms, and then from there uh, try to derive some of the parameters that normally you do in the lab or using very time-consuming uh, methods. So, as a good example of that, I'd like to present the work that Viridiana uh, has done for his, her PhD using some of the leaf clip spectrum measurements and she has produced really good calibrations for the estimation of things like nitrogen, 
or even photosynthetic traits like BC Max and JMAX. And um, the idea is to develop tools that will allow us to do use this as a screening mechanism for large populations in the field. Um, but the whole idea is to, uh, I mean, um, this really links to this part that instrument has, uh, that Gonzalo has shown, where uh, that is really designed for measuring uh, chlorophyll, but we can also try to estimate a number of different things apart from chlorophyll, like different pigments, photosynthetic or non-photosynthetic pigments, and also different um, uh, components in the leaf and, and tissues. And for using that, we use different techniques using mainly hyperspectrum. Um, I also wanted to bring some gear as well because obviously Gonzalo brought some. And this is an example. This is a leaf clip. So it's kind of uh, uses the same principle as the SPAD, only that instead of measuring in only two wavelengths, it measures uh, in around 1,000 wavelengths from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. So then obviously you can get the, uh, in this case, this measure both transmittance as the spot, but also reflectance. And the whole idea is that we can use this to determine, for example, ratios of pigments in the leaves um, for the different pigments, um, or like I said, other uh, components as well. So what other tools we have available at the HFPPC? So we have different spectrum measurement devices like this um, leaf clip, which is called uh, Osanoptics uh, leaf clip, and like I said, measure reflectance transmittance. We have the ESD that Viridiana has used, and the main difference is that it allows you to measure in a, in a broader range, so it allows you to determine other things that are beyond pigments that you can pick up here. We also have little spectrometers or multiple fiber spectrometers for measuring the uh, light quality and the distribution of light within the canopies, for example, uh, beyond just like uh, power measurements, um, which is like a really broad measurement of the light. Then we have a number of instruments for measuring uh, canopy traits, like canopy architecture, biomass, uh, even uh, con um, light interception uh, continuously. Um, we have more detailed instruments for measuring canopy uh, or plant architecture, like the plant scan, but that's really targeted for uh, single plants control environment studies. We have developed a range of um, tools for measuring canopy conduct, uh, can canopy temperature as a surrogate of canopy conductance, uh, and we've been doing that, for example, comparing the measurements with these different parameters, and we do that either at the local level, like control environment using flare uh, infrared cameras or even from a helicopter on a much better field scale. So if any of you is interested in um, running some of this equipment at the HFPPC, the main take home message is that it's not something that you can call me tomorrow and say, Benny, I want to use this or that instrument. So there's a process in place. And pretty much what it means is that you need to submit like a form, explain what you want to do. And then you need to get what, what we call a project inside the HFPPC. And for that project, that has to be approved by a, a executive committee that meets pretty much every uh, month. And then depending on the research interest uh, and the availability of resources in the center, you can get that approved. Um, um, and obviously, there's a, a user fees uh, that you may need to um, pay. Um, but pretty much the whole thing is that once you get the uh, approval, then uh, and then uh, in the director, uh, I mean, um, uh, the, like the project leader gets uh, nominated, then you can run the project and you can use any of the equipment in the HPPC. But it's important to keep in mind that there's yeah. some time yeah. frames. That's right. So I'll be, I'll be using the HPPC as an external customer, even though I'm the economics group. So um, if you, any of you would like to um, get to know the, the main place of the HPPC, I'm happy to liaise you with, with them. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it, you need to plan ahead, like Bernie said. Uh, you need to uh, have a good discussion with uh, Helen or Jamie, who are the, uh, the control conditions or the field uh, field environment uh, managers, and that actually is very good because it helps you to distill what you want to do and what you can do actually. And then there's a period of about 15 days uh, since uh, in between uh, each um, meeting, I think, or yeah. a month uh, for, the, for the board so to approve your project. So it's something you need to plan ahead. Yeah. And also, um, it is costly as well. So you need to really have a good hypothesis uh, or good question to test. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'd like to clarify, the little tools I, I mentioned uh, are belong to the photosynthesis yeah, team. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's the, right. The, the, 
the normal isolation you see, but you know, we're also happy to share if, if, if there's an opportunity to help. Yeah. I guess the other message as well is that, yeah, really plan in advance, and even when you are writing a project proposal or something, come and talk to us. So in the center, there's a, a kind of three research scientists, which is myself, David Deary for the field, and Xavier, who is the director of also the control environment research scientist. So if you come and talk to us, then we can really help you to clarify what tools are available, how you want to use them in your project, and if you're making the budget for the project, you can account for that before it's too late, and then you think that you like to use some of our equipment, and then you find that you didn't think about that in advance. So, yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Uh, big thank you to uh, Jose and Gonzalo for taking us through some of the tools that are used on the field. And they were our last speakers uh, for today. Uh, so thank you to all of the speakers that, that joined in today and, um, and sharing your knowledge with the centre. Uh, we hope that uh, today's session sparks some conversations uh, after today's session. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there's no, we not, haven't allowed any time for questions, so we're hoping that the one hour time slot will suit. Um, but we are actively looking for feedback as well on content and delivery and uh, hoping to, you know, um, accommodate the, the broader centre, um, you know, as, as it is. Uh, so thank you also for the, to the attendees for um, joining in on the session and supporting the first round of the professional development program. Uh, while I have you, you as an audience, I'd like to remind everyone that the mentoring expression of interest forms are closing this Friday. So if you'd like to be a part of the program, you'll need to submit your form sort of before the uh, close of business on Friday. Uh, if you have any questions about today's uh, content, feel free to contact the speakers directly or you can come to me and I can put you in contact with them also. Uh, but apart from that, thank you for joining in on today's session and I hope you have a great afternoon.